Let's talk education. Master's degrees, undergrads, let's go through it all. Let's get this conversation going about what is the point of getting education, relatively speaking, to our career. Is it accruing as much knowledge? Is it trying to get something from that master's degree that I know will help me in my future or my profession? Or is it just something arbitrary that now is included with every single application or job description that we have to go through to get a job? And I, I could tell you this directly, that we should probably evaluate that as a construct which we might be limiting our talent pool, or we might be restricting ourselves to certain people that either have the financial means or the capability of going through that. There could be a whole list of people out there we're missing out on as, as employers because we don't necessarily value the folks that come from these other settings like high school or private or FCS, NIA, JUCO, all these other places. A master's degree is important. Education is important. Consults and courses and books are all going to be critical. But we should start to look at what is the actual best case for a strength coach when we hire someone and how much education should play in that versus on the other end, how much is that person going to be able to develop and grow and how much can education facilitate that person bringing more value to our athletic department. So we got a lot to unpack here. Let's hit this module. So I'm going to preface this with, I got two master's degrees and two bachelor's degrees. Now I'm going to go into a pretty long discussion on maybe that was a mistake. But one of the things that I want to get across is being more educated, being more knowledgeable, being more skill, skilled in any capacity is never a bad thing. It's just this: the conversation needs to be centered off of if we need to change our profession, meaning that we need to improve the process to becoming a strength coach from not having to sacrifice as much money for a job that doesn't necessarily equate to a lot of monetary value or worth then we need to kind of go into this idea, was two master's degrees actually worth it? Now, I'm going to go back 20 years ago when I was looking to enter the field. And I was an undergrad, got my first degree in mathematics, didn't really want to do that. And then I went back to school for what they call movement science, which is the equivalent of kinesiology, biomechanics, or exercise science in most other undergrads. Now, the trajectory I was in, was set up for a lot of corporate wellness, a lot of cardiac rehab, group exercise, that kind of dynamic, because that's where the jobs are, right? If you look at it for the majority of the country, there's going to be no shortage of group exercise instructors. There's going to be no shortage of cardiac rehab. There's going to be no shortage of working in corporate wellness, maybe even a little bit of physical therapy or, I mean, personal training for these big conglomerates out there. So there's going to be job opportunities. So my undergrad was centered on that. ACSM, get your certification, go through all the process of that, which if you're not familiar with that, actually not that, um, not that easy to go through. Uh, I was one of two people actually to get that certification from my graduating class. The process though led into, I wanted to go into strength conditioning and that wasn't going to serve me. So I wanted to get two parts. One, I needed to get experience, and we talked about interning in our last module. But the other part was I thought that the way to actually get an edge on competition was to have a master's degree. Now, let's say how this worked out. I actually got a job before I completed my master's degree, so it kind of made the idea of me needing to get a master's degree or multiple actually obsolete. And as I started to go through that process of working and going through looking all the spectrums, and I've been through doing this long enough to experience the downside, downturn of strength conditioning where they made to this like apex at the late 2000s, the economy started to crash, they started to do furloughs, they started to do layoffs, they started to do cutbacks. People weren't going to game, weren't watching it on TV. Money was a little bit scarce. So cutbacks were happening. So that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to hustle and finish my master's degree remotely from Springfield College. But while I'm going through that, because it wasn't really something they were commonly doing, so I was doing a lot of research remotely. I was doing a lot of less organizational stuff. Um, I was finishing up my, my master's thesis and my research design going through that whole process I ended up getting an online master's from Cal U of Pennsylvania and to be honest 
all were really great. I really loved my experience. But I paid out of pocket for the Cal U1 in Pennsylvania. I was able to get a graduate assistant and was able to get that comp, comp from being a graduate assistant student at Springfield College. Now, let's look at the way this played out. Every single job I ever applied to, it had no, no actual tangible impact. Me having multiple bachelor's and multiple, multiple master's degrees. Zero. Zero. Now, the other end of it, it's become a pretty big qualifier for applicants, right? You'll see a lot of college trade conditioning jobs. Essentially, here, what we're going through the funneling process, right? We just get way too many applicants, and it's hard to filter it. So what we just do is add these stipulations or conditions to whittle it down. And the thought would be is if I get a more refined group, I can kind of eliminate the fluff. And I like, attribute it to a lot like recruiting, right, where I'm working at an academy or an Ivy League school. Just get them off the board if they don't have a 3.0 GPA and over 1,200 on the SATs. This ain't going to happen. Just get them off the board. Right. If you don't have an undergraduate degree, if you don't have your CSCS or CSCCA, if you don't have your first aid CPR, if you don't have a master's degree, if you don't have three to five years of experience, I can just start to remove you. Right. And I can just start to get you off the board and I can start to whittle it down to more qualified candidates. But what it does is creates this very incestuous, very limited group. And what I was talking about in our internship, that was your interview. What I was talking about just starting, you need experience to get experience. It's the great irony of strength and conditioning. So what do we do? We just start to fill that time while I'm trying to get experience with education. We start to do whatever we can in the moment to start to get traction in our career. Now this is a little bit, in hindsight, a really bad strategy because you're paying out of pocket for something that's not going to increase your value to a future employer. You're going to go into some sort of debt, whether it's a form of student loans or if you're in a situation where you do get your master's paid for, but you still have to pay out of pocket for living expenses or live in a part of the world that you don't really have a lot of inroads or connections. It's going to come at the expense. Or the other end of it is those are years that you're not gaining an income. Right. Let's look at the majority of us who went into strength conditioning. It took us three to five years to actually get a full time position. Maybe there's people in our hometown who just bypassed going to school in general and got a trade making six figures at 21 years old. And by the time I was actually getting to the point where I was above 50 K a year, I was 32 and I have several friends that I grew up with that were buying homes buying her second or third car. I was just now trying to figure out ways to cut back and utilize the resources and the amenities I have at school to hopefully get ahead and get out of debt. And that's the great paradox of this. I have such an advanced level understanding in education. I'm whittled myself into probably one of the, part, the smallest percentiles of a group you can possibly get into, but still making 50K a year living in a major metropolitan city like Los Angeles, not really getting you fur that further along. And you think about it, most people who get their master's degrees, most people who get internships actually get paid or get more from that actual than not, right? If I do an internship at Goldman Sachs, chances are I'm gonna get a really good outcome from that. If I'm doing a residency, which is different than an internship, but the same kind of principle of you go through school and then you start to get clinical hours, the monetary value of that is going to be immense, relatively speaking, to strength conditioning, where you better, you're, you're lucky to get a 10-month position with no benefits because it's such a high demand, low actual or high barrier of entry job to get into. And like I said before, if I'm an employer, I'm trying to figure out ways to cut and whittle that pool to get it to something where I can just start to say, all right, there, these are five really good candidates. Let me go through the process of interviewing them. And that's the problem with this is we are accruing more education, more understanding, which again is talked about in our introduction and within our actual internship in the beginning, it's becoming less and less value, valuable what you actually know that the, the things that you actually know versus the things you actually can do are now no longer the same. And 
we need to evaluate the value of education in getting a master's degree. And again, 20 years ago, it was a lot different. It was a lot different. It was a lot different from the context of we didn't have a lot of edge and a lot of traction within athletic departments. We were still proving ourselves. We didn't have much of a budget. I mean, even as late as 2014, we had $20,000 a year for everything at USC, including supplements and equipment and any continuing education, which you might say, wow, that's a lot of money. It's really not. Between seven employees and, and hundreds of athletes that you're dealing with, like, it's not going to get you very far. You know, comparatively speaking, by the time we left, the nutrition budget was well over 350 grand a year. You know, just think how much has changed. And the staff has grown exponentially. So looking at it 10, 15 years ago, that we're trying to get some sort of momentum in an athletic department, having a master's degree or having a full staff with master's degrees, because they don't really have any context of what's a good or bad certification, right? They don't know the difference between getting a weekend certification or a high level one where you need an undergraduate degree to actually sit for. There's not much context between that as far as 15 years ago was. Now it's a rule and a stipulation. But the reality was us getting a master's degree was a way to show credibility to the athletic department. We didn't have a nationally accredited certification process. Comparatively speaking to the NATA and athletic training, we were viewed as an entity that was maybe a little bit crass, maybe a little bit uneducated, maybe a little bit of probably not not supposed to be there. So getting a master's degree was pretty hard to argue at the time. Hey, they, these folks are real. You know, these guys are contributors. These guys are doing amazing things and they're not just jocks with t-shirt and shorts on all day. They're actually highly educated staff that can bring a lot of value to their athletic departments. But now we look at it, it's been a qualifier. It's eliminated a lot of people that probably would have a a great impact in any athletic department they're working in. Not only that, it's made the barrier of entry a lot higher to get into. And the other part, it's made the investment to actually becoming a coach a lot more. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are going to be sunk into just becoming a strength coach to make thirty dollars to $40,000 a year. The economics just don't match up. And the job security, and we'll talk about this in the later modules, but the job security is not there. And I think the great ultimate litmus is you try to explain this to someone in your family and you try to walk them through that. And you try to you know, justify going and getting a master's degree at $40,000 a year and going to countless certifications and all these other things. And they're going to look at it. You're like, are you making 500 grand to start out of this? Like, how does this work out? How are you ever going to come out of this hole? Right? And we're talking about long-term implications because what's going to happen eventually is you're going to accrue so much debt and you have to pay that off. And then you start to develop other things like family and buying homes and having kids and buying cars and doing all the stuff you do with families and all that stuff. That's more debt on top of already an incredible amount of debt. Maybe you've been putting it on your credit card, which is an even more risky proposition because it's a higher interest rate. And my, my point of all this is we need to visit the idea of this construct of master's degrees being a prerequisite to getting a job as a strength coach. And again, talking to a guy who's got two, talking to a guy who puts a lot of value on education. I've always thought that was my edge. I always thought that was my, my thing, relatively speaking, to everyone else, is my competency and my skill. But the reality is, is at what point do we have to evaluate the economics just don't match up? You know, we essentially are doing minimum wage work and having our staff having to get the equivalency of a doctorate in terms of education. You know, if you look at the time served from actual undergrad, graduate school, and then going into internships, it's going to be a five, six year process. Anyone's going to say you're going to go to school before, go to seven years before you get a job. We'll say, oh, well, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer? No, I'm going to be a strength coach. And what do you make? Thirty to $40,000 a year to start, if I'm lucky. And I'm going to have to make a great sacrifice and move all the way around the country and just to get an opportunity. But that's the way you do it. And one of the things that we'll talk about in the book, actually, 
is the market values are not really not there, right? We talk about the market value can be anywhere from zero to 100,000, and the median is right here at 500,000. So you think, oh, okay, like there potentially is, I can be on this side of the upper percentile of making money. But the problem is, it's, it's a lot more skewed to the people making under 60 grand than it is to people making over 500 grand. And that median, that midway point, should be looked at more as a mean and the average and looked more towards under 100 grand, right? The, the probably mean salary is probably somewhere around $47,000. $47, so it, it makes that 100,000, 500,000 million, million dollar salary potential, but the reality is you're probably gonna settle in for 40 to 50 grand for you know, mo maybe towards the somewhat peak of your career. And the other end of it is who's to say we can't get our master's degree after we get through a certain process of getting a job? And I think that goes into what we'll talk about in interviewing is the expectation is you're going to be as good as you possibly can be after you, until you get the job. So if I get the job, that's probably as good as you'll ever be. And that's the way most professions work, right? You go to undergrad, you go to grad. That is the peak of whatever your skill and knowledge will be. But I don't think that's true for strength conditioning. We've shown exponential improvement after we get the job. We go to certifications, we read books, we refine our craft, we're constantly practicing, we're constantly learning. We've shown in a tremendous upside after, right? So if we're looking at this comparatively speaking to signing in the NFL and I'm a running back and I sign for a rookie minimum and I run for 2,000 yards, my, that is, that should have some sort of back-end incentives and saying, wow, you over-promised, like you over-delivered, relatively speaking. And I think that's the process most people really don't appreciate. And it's not a guarantee, which is hard. Right? It's hard to say that whatever it is. But we're not getting the compensation based off the education we're, and the time we're putting in. So what needs to kind of change is this paradigm shift from don't value me at the beginning, value me as I go. You know, One of the best things we, we talked about in our last actual module was the best form of feedback is getting more responsibility. But that responsibility should be tied into getting more compensation. If you have more things you're required to do, it probably means that you're you're more skilled than when you started. You're definitely showing a competency and capability to do something in a high level. And then the other part is you're becoming more and more indispensable. You have more actual value to the organization or the team. So therefore, your compensation should go up with that. And the hard part is the game's all about leverage and the game's all about, well, what other opportunities do you have and we'll value you once someone else puts value into you. But the reality is just like going through an internship and proving your worth and showing your capability should lead to getting either an opportunity to work there or a rapid opportunity right after that somewhere else. Same thing after I get the job, that the only time I actually get more compensation is if I go to another job. So that creates this con context that every single thing I'm doing from continuing education is leading into this idea of that's for me in the next job, not for the current job, which is asinine. It doesn't make sense. So what I'm suggesting is get a lot of experience coaching people. Get a lot of experience being as good as you possibly can be. And then after you get the job, and here's the other elephant in the room, we need to change as employers, right? We need to change as stop looking at these very sick, select group of people, that this pool of people and the amount of people we can actually hire from is immense. Yeah, I do think we need to have the CSCS or CSCCA in terms of college strength conditioning or professional strength conditioning. I think that's an important step. But the other note is it shouldn't be locked into you need to have a master's degree in three to five years of experience. In fact, give me that person that's working at a Division II or FCS school or at a high school or in the private sector because those are the folks that are more, have higher levels of creativity. They're a little bit more industrious. They're a little bit more, they have a lot of, a little bit more ingenuity. They, they can problem solve at a higher level. And the problem when you hire someone with a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge is they have, you're taking with that knowledge and experience their bias, their preference, the association of where they used to work for before, which is not a bad thing. Maybe it comes with some high standards, but it's a lot of times it's hard. It's hard. Like you have to have a conversation eventually about like, I, I don't care what you did there. 
Like, I get it. It was good. You loved it there. You were, you're sad. You got fired, blah, blah, blah. But at a certain point, what are you going to do for what we need you here for? Like, how are you going to help this organization and team get better? What problems do we have and how can we solve them? And you find that people who have to become more resourceful with their time, and these are the folks that don't have master's degrees. These are the folks that couldn't afford to do three, four internships. These are the folks that, you know, just going about their work every single day, busting their ass, they're probably going to bring a lot more value. So if they apply, they're going to be pushed to the side because they're not really that valuable, relatively speaking, to a person with master's degrees and several jobs or internships before that. Again, it's a, it's a ass backwards system. But the truth is, it's probably the better person's right there who's more capable, more competent, or at least more willing to do that. And then once you get them in, you say, okay, now we need to increase your level. We're going to provide you a master's degree. It's going to be hard, but we're going to pay you to get your master's degree. And then once you get that master's degree, now your value goes up. And we give you more compensation because you have that, right? Because if you're going to get a master's degree as a teacher, if you're going to get a master's degree or any continuing education in any other profession, your value to that corporation and company is now up. And then your compensation goes up because you are, in theory, more valuable. Now it works, doesn't work that way in strength and conditioning because the highest you ever make within that organization is at the beginning. Sometimes it's just random why you get more money, but it shouldn't be that way. If I get more continuing education, if I learn more, if I increase my skill, if I take on more responsibility, in theory, I should be able to get more compensation. But that's where we got to really start to work on and we got to start to figure out things. And you right now trying to get a job or you being a current strength coach, there is an idea that you are not supposed to be the sacrificial lamb. You're not supposed to be the one that has to get on a table and fight for what's right. But the reality is we probably all can resonate with the idea. It's a little bit antiquated the way we do things. And it's a little bit misguided the things that we ask our staff to do just to get the job. Because knowing that we're never going to pay them any bit of adequacy, relatively speaking, to the amount they need to invest to get in the job. So that's where we need to get to. And if you're looking at this as like, all right, man, I just did my undergrad. I'm really evaluating the next steps. Well, I would start to look at maybe a master's degree. Master's degree is not as important as you want it to be because you're trying to create traction towards your goal. You're trying to get momentum in some way towards where you want to be. It's productive procrastination in a lot of ways. That I can fill time and space with getting more education, spending more money with no guarantee. It's no, no objective. Remember the conversation I had with my father of what happens if you don't get a uh, job after this fourth, fifth internship. I'll just do another internship. At a certain point... I'm not saying cut your losses, but you need to evaluate what you're doing because you're dumping more and more money into this isn't working. It's not working the way it should. Why can't I get a job after one internship? Why not? Like there should be enough opportunity. Maybe it's a little bit of humility. Maybe it's an ego thing. I don't know. But on the other note, if I would really want to be a strength coach and help people, going back to my why, it should start with, Get me that job and that opportunity so I don't have to accrue a lot of debt. And I can do this at a higher level in the future because I can start to acquire more education and more knowledge once I start to get edgewise towards quality of life and living something that I can actually afford my bill, pay my bills, and start my actual life. And that's the thought process here. Let's not put this cart before the horse and saying, get your education, spend all this money on certifications and consults and all those other things. Start to get traction towards getting that job faster and then from there improving yourself constantly because that, that's not i don't think that's the fear here that people aren't going to get better after they get the job so that if we don't get the master's degree if we don't do five internships if we don't get countless certifications and consults and read these books that that is never going to happen after you get the job i just don't think that's going to be the case and i could be wrong on that and maybe we built in this level of insecurity and constantly striving for more based off how hard the process was of being a coach or strength coach. So we don't ever want to lose that edge. But my hunch is that strength coaches are going to be growth mindset folks. And they're going to look at 
challenges and opportunities and you look at constant development and, and improving themselves is always going to be at the forefront of who they are as people. So that would be what I would say. Let's, let's take a stop here. Let's look at these modules and this module in particular, and we'll start to have ask ourselves, like, what did I really get from my master's degree? If I'm looking to get one, what am I going to get from that, relatively speaking, to getting a job or doing another internship or finding some place that actually going to give me a better chance of getting a job? And the other part is, what is the value of education when we're looking through the future of our profession? Right? Is it just getting more and more knowledge without any real direct application to our job? Or is it actually something we can work on directly to either get more financial compensation or bring more value towards our school, which there shouldn't be mutual exclusive. They should be one and the same. There should be synergy. I bring more value, I get more money. Let's not say we're martyrs here. Let's not say that we want to be this, I would die on the platform and I don't care if I'm making $10 an hour. We are highly educated, highly skilled, highly competent, highly valuable people in our industry and our professions. We should be compensated accordingly. And we should look at our salary, relatively speaking, not just to what the top person makes and the bottom person makes, but what's the mean, meaning the average, that 40 to 50K, and how do we push that upwards as opposed to just settling? All right, so take a second here, go through the, go through the, the actual task that we're actually going through. If you haven't read the book, I highly, highly suggest you go through that part too there as well. All right.